Baldur's Gate 3 is an enormous game full of secret locations, interactions, and items for you to find. It can be all too easy to simply wander past some awesome things in-game without ever knowing they're there. Which is why, in this video, we'll be going over 25 hidden free gifts for you to pick up across your playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. Ready? Then let's get to it. Kicking things off right at the beginning, you can literally get one of the best starting weapons for heavier classes, that's barbarians, paladins, fighters, and rangers, before you even leave the Nautiloid. Commander Zalk is one of the Cambian bosses found fighting the Mind Flayer at the helm, and whilst the game kind of suggests you fully run past him and just finish the prologue, defeating and looting him will allow us to pick up the Everburn Blade Greatsword, which deals an additional d4 of fire damage on every hit. A weapon my Dark Urge Paladin actually continued to use throughout Act 1, looking absolutely awesome on your back and being usable pretty much throughout the entire game. Those on Tactician difficulty or above, though, might find actually defeating Dalk with a party of level 1s to be nigh on impossible, though. In which case, simply make sure to free Shadow Hearts, equip her with the command spell before heading into the fight, and with a bit of luck, you can command him to drop the sword before sprinting right past and grabbing it, severely weakening Zalk against the Mind Flare as well. Just make sure it's in some somebody's inventory before connecting the transponder nerves. Now, this next one is an easy to miss treasure around the Nautiloid Crash region, and involves jumping down to this ledge right by where we meet Astarian, making sure to bring someone strong like Shadowheart or Lazel. Ideally, somebody in the party will pass a nature check, allowing you to move this rock by just dragging and dropping it. Inside the chest below is a Harper's stash containing some nice loot, among which are notes on the local Selenite sects and a map, which will immediately guide you to the peak above, where there's a campfire and yet more treasures including a silver pendant, which can add an extra d4 to our dice rolls. Very nice to have, especially at the start of the game. Over in the Emerald Grove now, and something you may not come across is an entire hidden vault buried beneath a totem statue in the Apothecary Lab. To access it though, you'll need to obtain the Wolf Rune, which is being held by Wrath, who will impart it as a reward after successfully rescuing Halzin and saving the Grove. So make sure to remember to speak to him after doing that. Or if you're not planning on saving the Grove at all, or just want access to these treasures sooner, then it is possible, with a character like Astarian say, to quickly pick pickpocket the thing off of him. Within the vault itself can be found an assortment of potions, spells, and poisons, as well as the Robe of Summer, which grants cold resistance, and the Sorrow Glaive, which allows us to use Thorn Whip as an additional action to pull enemies towards us. Fittingly druidic, and good to pick up. When first meeting Karlak in Act 1, she'll lead us to the Toll House just above the river to deal with the paladins that are hunting her. Once that's done though, and the Toll House is clear, make sure not to miss this trap door, to discover a whole extra wealth of items beneath. Initially, this room may not look like much, and the large doors I couldn't seem to lockpick, but by using a knock spell or gaseous forming through the small hole at the side of the building, we can access the rest of the basement. I'd recommend bringing Astarian to disable these traps, then just loot around and grab whatever you want. However, within this hidden basement, concealing another hidden basement, hides yet another hidden basement beyond that, for which you'll need to sit people in both of these chairs at the same time. Doing so will lower a wall between them to unveil yet another treasure trove of potions and a lot of weapons, including a sweet, sweet paladin item, the Gloves of Heroism, increasing our hit points and preventing us from getting frightened whenever we channel our oath spells. So overall, definitely a lot of hidden gifts under this place. Now for a shield with an extra bit of added protection, which can be easily picked up for free near to the goblin camp. You'll want to come to the main entrance, then taking a left, climb up to the battlements above, before leaping up even higher to these ledges, and do be warned, landing on this lower one will awaken a nearby bugbear, whom it's best to put back to sleep using a lithid powers. Having snuck past them, and leapt up to this more obscure top area, you're free to come around to the chest here, taking extra special care not to set off the traps along this ledge. And with a lock pick or knock spell, pick up the glowing shield, which with every short rest will grant us 8 temporary extra hit points whenever we drop below 50% health. Now don't get me wrong, there's definitely better shields out there to be found, some of which we'll come to, but early in Act 1, just hidden away up here, it's certainly worth picking up, especially given that odds are more than one of your party could use a shield. 
Heading into the Shattered Sanctum, and the first obscure but very useful item to pick up is acquired from the cells behind Priestess Guts area. We can of course allow her to entrap us there, but equally lockpicking the door behind her and having one character successfully sneak in will get our whole party inside more easily. Of course, we'll then also have to deal with her ogre guard named Palmer. But fighting her off as a party, or blagging our way in as not a prisoner, is far easier than getting captured. Coming to the bed at the end of the room, then, and you'll find an amulet of Misty Step, allowing us to teleport to a location we can see, and serving as an utter game changer both during fights and exploration. Of course, to any magic users, owning this spell will probably already be a given, but equipping it on a character who doesn't already own such a thing can be incredibly useful for all manner of reasons, some of which we'll come to later in the video. It could be used as an alternative to fly or featherfall, or just for escaping a tight situation. And is always, always worth picking up at this point in the game. Also, a fun little way that you can exit this area afterwards is to shoot the cage at the top of the holding cell, jump down the hole, or perhaps now use Misty Step, and head through the cave entrance. Now, as I said in the first video, we may not even have to spite the fighters below by passing an animal handling check, and actually instead setting them against the goblins. Alternatively, a path through that last area can bring us to the Underdark, where we'll be exploring next. And the first hidden free gift we can find down here is at the end of the explosive mushroom chamber, where we go to rescue Balin. And actually, here's one such example as to where a necklace of Misty Step could be useful, and means we don't have to use the scrolls from Balin's pack and can still easily save him too. But once you've done so, take a look at the ledge up here. You can even explode all the mushrooms now to make it easier, but afterwards, Misty step up here to uncover a skeleton holding the explorer's ring. A nice little boon to equip one of your characters with, which adds an additional one to both your survival and nature skills. Now, higher survival makes us more likely to detect hidden treasure chests, whilst nature can come very much in handy when dealing with things outside. So worth having on someone in your party, if only to make it more easy to spot the chests whilst well, exploring. At the base of this chamber as well though, is arguably an even better item. The item Balin was originally sent out to get, the mushroom called Noble Stork. Now, there's a couple options as to who we give the Noble Stork Mushroom to, so you're gonna want to choose carefully. Consuming it as the Dark Urge, or convincing Shadowheart to consume it, will restore a couple memories for both, and provide a little expansion on the history of either of those characters. But if we speak to Dereth, she'll ask us to give it to her. An example of Speculate to Accumulate, because heading to her Bone Cloak's Apothecary in Act 3, we'll be able to buy three more from her. Though granted, that's no longer a free gift, and a according to online forums, is no longer something Shadowheart can consume by then. Equally, we can go behind Dareth's back and give it to her somewhat brain-addled husband, Balin. Though that's not necessarily the best choice either, as he'll turn from a mindless fool back into seemingly a conniving and abusive husband. Another option, however, that can reward us with an awesome free gift is to head to the big mushroom above and use it to cure Dulla. Bear in mind, we don't actually need the Noble Stalk for this though. A cure poison potion will work just as well, so maybe save that precious mushroom for one of the other things. But with Silver Cured, she'll gift us a pair of boots that she stole from the Dwergar. The Boots of Speed essentially grant the movement bonuses only usually enjoyed by rogues onto any of our other classes, bestowing the Click Heal action for a ton of extra movement per turn in combat. Pairing that in fact with the Misty Step Necklace can make for one hell of a nimble warrior. Also in the Underdark, though, is one of the only very rare weapons you can acquire in Act 1. Though I say acquire, I more mean kind of build by gathering together the three different pieces from around the main area. See, a while ago, a drow expedition party headed down here in search of the Adamantine Forge, with its three main members being Dawn, Zagrim, and Philro, who, possibly to strengthen their contractual obligations to one another, opted to split a staff named Morning Frost into three parts and have one of each. 
but when Zagrim betrayed the party and summoned a spectator, these three parts were scattered across the Underdark. The Helve is still found on Dorne's petrified body, just down from the Salianite outpost, but we will have to deal with the spectator, which is still here. Most likely it'll free and kill Dorne in the ensuing battle to be freely looted, but if not, he'll seemingly attack us anyway, leading to the same result. The next part is found on Philro the Forgotten, who'll attack us over by the Susser tree along with a band of hook horrors, but successfully taking him down will get us the next part, the Icy Crystal. And finally, the Icy Metal final piece can of course be found on Zagrim's body, the pale corpse found in a locked chamber of the Myconid colony. A chamber that will be opened for us by defeating the Dwergar by the lake, or else beforehand passing a perception check will alert us to the existence of the door, which we can then, without any trouble from the Myconids, open with a knock spell. And so, with all three pieces gathered from the three heads of the Drow expedition, we can simply recombine them to build Morning Frost. Something I personally chose to give to Gale, not only for its superior melee damage, but also the Ray of Frost cantrip and general emphasis on improving frost-based attacks. Really cool find and not an obvious weapon at first. Another cool free item that equally requires a few additional steps is located over in the Arcane Tower. Getting around the sentry turrets as usual and powering up the generator with a Sussa Bloom in order to use the elevator. Our item will be on the very bottom floor, but to reach the genuine base of the tower, we'll first have to head to the greenhouse to find and read the threadbare book. Containing a particular line, we'll then need to say to Bernard, the automaton guard at the top of the tower. Doing this, he'll hand over the guiding light ring. A free gift in and of itself, with a useful if unexciting ability of casting light, but more importantly, wearing this ring whilst using the elevator will open up access to the bottom floor, housing a ton of scrolls for us to loot and several bits of lore text, as well as the Staff of Arcane Blessing. Another good item to have, but not as good as Morning Frost, I wouldn't say. But in the gilded chest next to it is the Sparks Wall Ring, something you want to keep around should you come across any electrical based enemies, given its ability to fully prevent you from getting electrocuted. I mean, if you wanted, you'd actually, ironically, be far more resistant to fight Bernard now. But what better to go with a lightning resistant ring than an accompanying lightning resistant shield of a very similar name. The real Sparky Sparks wall can be found in the earlier half of the Grimforge area of the Underdark, up near where we find the deep roads being worked to death. You'll want to come down and jump across to this little ledge here, and be careful because this chest is trapped. But successfully disarming and lockpicking it, we will find inside, very simply, this Sparky shield capable of emitting a lightning aura an AoE attack that consumes three lightning charges we've built up to emit a lasting electrocution effect on any nearby enemies. Kind of like Shadowheart Spirit Guardians, not nearly as goated as those, but then doesn't also use up a spell slot. Though bear in mind this shield won't be that effective unless used alongside even more lightning gear. The Sparks Wall Ring is nice to pair it with, but we'll actually also need weapons or armor capable of granting us lightning charges, which the shield feeds on. So let's briefly head back above ground to the starting region where we can find quite a few. The easiest way to get a lightning weapon then is the first time we come to Akeen's Rest, wherein the building at the end is on fire and we have to rescue Councillor Floric before she burns to death. Something you want to make sure to do not only for this, but also for several other encounters when reaching Act 3. For now though, simply head in and rescue her and she'll reward you with a choice, one of three weapons, all of which can bestow two lightning charges every time they deal damage. Which is best for you will depend on your build and personally I went for the Jolt Shooter Bow. A free gift, yes, hidden, that's debatable. What is hidden though are the speedy light feet boots, capable of granting all three lightning charges needed for the shield every time you dash in combat. And to get these, simply come to the Blighted Village, head to the windmill at the top where Barkus is first getting bullied, and head through this little hatch to the cellar below, where there's simply a big chest containing the boots. Easy to miss, but very worth getting early on, especially if you plan to use other items like the shield. 
Now it's time to head into the mountains and meet the Githyanki at Kresh Yelek. Before heading inside the Kresh though, you'll want to explore the upper part of the ruined monastery. And let me draw your attention especially to this area at the top, with a sort of stained glass circle on the floor and surrounding altars. Each of these need a corresponding ceremonial weapon in accordance to what each of the guys are holding in their stained glass portrait. The sword should already be in place, so next you'll want to head to the southeast of that room and break a nearby wall to get to this guardian of faith, below whom is a battle axe that we'll also need. Then, on this southern sort of outcrop of the monastery, is the grave of Dawnmaster Stockhold, whose ceremonial mace is a bit rusted, but should still do the job. And finally, up on the roof is the nest of some giant eagles, who just happen to be sitting on the warhammer that we also need. It'll be a case of fighting them, or possibly passing a nature check to acquire that. Then, with all four, chuck them onto their corresponding altars to reveal a little hidden chamber. Not containing our warders such, not yet, but rather the key to unlock such reward, now down in the crash. Pursuing this questline naturally should eventually lead us to the Inquisitor's chamber, and before speaking to anyone, I'd recommend coming to this side room, twisting the statues and heading into the secret chamber, progressing through here, avoiding the beams, and destroying the energy crystals to progress, including this very hard to spot one that you'll have to come down to a ledge for. You'll eventually, after all this, make it to a massive open area, housing one of the best weapons in the game. The Blood of the Thander can firstly heal you before dying once per long rest, emits a constant holy light that damages undead, and is capable of casting the level 6 sunbeam spell for massive radiant damage to everything in front of you. Now hopefully you brought the Dawn Master Crest from the first part of this quest, because otherwise removing the Blood of the Thander will bring down the entire monastery. Perhaps not as hidden as other entries in this video, but I personally missed it on my first run and it's such a great weapon that I don't want any anyone else to do the same. Before we leave the mountains though, there's one more thing you want to absolutely make sure to pick up. As somebody who relies on Astarian to lockpick pretty much every door in the game, he tends to be in my party a lot, simply for convenience, and thus does better for having some more fitting weapons that suit stealth well. The knife of the Undermountain King, which seems like it formerly belonged to a Dwegar, is one such weapon. Admittedly, initially not free, sold by Ajak near Jira at the southeastern end of the Kresh, and depending on how you conclude this questline, that may very well be how it remains, in which case you will need to buy it, or perhaps with a lot of luck and speed, you can just pickpocket the thing. However, if like most, your playthrough of this part of the game ends in bloodshed and you have to fight your way out, not a given, just a likely possibility, then of course don't forget to fight your way through this part of the crash, taking her down as you do so to still be able to loot the knife of the Undermountain King. What's more, heading this way is actually the easiest way to exit the crash, coming straight out onto the mountainside and to safety, with a brand new weapon that has a high likelihood of landing crits and automatically rerolls if dealing low damage. For Astarian's sneak melee attack especially, it is absolutely lethal and I'd highly recommend. Finally coming into Act 2 though, and first up in the northern end of the shadowed battlefield, not far from Last Light, is a sad story which begins just up from this little encampment where we find the skeleton of a guy who thought he could score a little gold, around when the shadow curse started to take hold. See, an old man used to camp by the grave of his wife named Ellie May, who was buried with a precious family heirloom. Now, whether this guy in particular was paid by the husband to retrieve Ellie's ring, or this is just a grave robber who saw an opportunity isn't entirely clear, but in either case, the guy sadly succumbed to the shadow curse within literal sight of his destination. So coming to the camp below, we'll find Ellie's grave, but it'll be empty, and you'll have to head to this ledge behind where an animal has actually now stolen her ring. Simply pass the perception check below, and finally though, we will be able to retrieve it, named the family ring, and providing the wearer with an additional two death saving throws. In essence, if her character is downed, we'll have a lot more opportunity to revive them before they fully die. Useful item, and the story does a little more world building for the Shadowlands too. Now, the Toll Collector's House is something I discussed in the previous video to this, though what I've also discovered since then is if we come right down to the southeastern side of this building, there's some sealed heavy oak doors. Seems like this Toll House, just the same as earlier in Act 1, is also housing a secret cellar. Okay, maybe this bit isn't so secret, but pass the perception check inside and it'll reveal a hidden button leading to another secret area behind the bookshelves, containing gold, a soul coin, and again another hidden cave below that 
that, with it seems some skeletons that died camping out here. Now, personally, I feel like there's even more to this location, but can't seem to find any secret passages beyond this. So if any of you have, then please comment it below. Next you want to head to the Moonrise Tower's fast travel and head directly north until you come to this statue, and after dealing with any surrounding enemies, activate the three plaques in a specific order. Middle facing north first, then west, then east. Basically spelling out some lines in the correct order, and it'll unlock an entire hidden chamber below. This is the Sharan Sanctuary, and thanks to Shah's protection, is one of the few areas out here free from the Shadow Curse. Below are three statues, and coming to each you'll need to pass a combination of wisdom and intelligence and charisma checks, to unlock a further chamber within, containing some nice rewards. Now, the easiest way to deal with this whole area is to come here with Shadowheart before Act 2's point of no return, since whatever happens after that, she can clear all three of these statues without dice rolls and perform the blood offering afterwards. This will also give her plus 5 to charisma, wisdom and intelligence until her next long rest, and a few nice scrolls and potions. Now, you can steal the ritual dagger as well, though that will trigger a fight with the three sentinels. Guards you'd also have had to face if you didn't use Shadow Hearts and failed any of the previous dice rolls. The dagger does deal some bonus necrotic damage and is possibly worth having, though there are far better ones out there. So it all kind of depends on how many people in your party use daggers. Heading into Moonrise Towers though, and specifically down into the prison cells where the Tieflings and Wolbrin are being kept. Because there's an amulet you'll absolutely want for one of your magic users. Though in order to get it, you'll have to loot it from the Warden down here. And I do mean looted specifically because it won't show up in their pickpocketing inventory. And taking her down without alerting everybody else in the prison can be a little bit fiddly, especially with the scrying eyes flying about. So I'd recommend trying sneak attacks on those first whilst out of sight, and then the way I defeated the Warden was to attack from the upper level of the central tower as a Starion. A couple more guards might run to her aid though, and then you'll just have to take them down too. Equally, you could just fight off the entire lower level alongside Walbrin and the Tieflings, but either way, make sure to loot the Warden for the Spell Crux Amulet, capable of replenishing a spell slot of any level per long rest, basically allowing you to cast one extra of whatever your highest level spells are at the time. Or you could give it to someone like Will to restore a Warlock slot and essentially buff his spell pool from 2 to 3. Time to head into Act 3 now, and the first thing we're going to want to find is a dagger that I like to use alongside the knife of the Undermountain King. During the open hand temple murders, you'll of course end up heading down into the tunnels below. Before we do though, we can of course interview the murder victims using the Speak with Dead spell, and Brilgor, who's buried out back, mentions he died by being pierced once and paralysed thereafter. And when we come down to the area where we have to fight these guys, look carefully, because buried in a small hole here is the murder weapon that was no doubt used to kill Brilgor. Stillmaker is a very rare and cool looking dagger that comes with the ability to hold someone in place. In fact, I was able to target two enemies with it at once. Personally, I use it in the offhand for the sake of the spell, but it can also in that case make for a good secondary attack option. Either way, easy to get, but very, very easy to miss. Before you head into Worms Rock and their main city though, take a sharp left at the checkpoints and follow the path until you come across a confrontation between the Guild of Nine Fingers and Agents of the Stone Lords. Resolve that whichever way you choose, and then first thing to do after is head to this docked ship and loot this middle bit marked storage for two more Mind Flayer specimens. After that though, the big prize of this area can be found through this hidden little passageway to the south, a smuggler's cove containing a stash of riches. Though the one we want is inside a trapped chest, so I'd recommend bringing a Starion. The Bone Spike boots are one of the best sets in the game for any character who doesn't wear armour, like wizards or especially monks. Increasing our jump distance by a massive 1.5 meters, which is immediately noticeable, but also they grant the awesome combat utility of Brutal Leap, whereby basically jumping towards an enemy, there's a high chance of knocking them prone, granting an immediate advantage as soon as we leap into a fight. Basically, they're awesome and can be acquired right at the start of Act 3. 
picking up on the murder trail again and following it a little further though, and one of the victims in the lower city is Alexander Rainforest, a quirky guy, it seemed, with a fondness for feeding his resident rats various types of cheeses. Not that the rats seemed particularly bothered when Alexander was eventually killed as some sacrifice. So many red morsels fell out of Alexander. They tasted like salt and rust. Very good. Even better than cheese. Nice. Though the rats isn't the only secret of this home, and there's actually also a hatch here leading to a larger than usual cellar, perhaps connecting to the catacombs once upon a time. Watch out for the traps as you explore, but otherwise there's a bunch of free loot down here, and a safe containing a fair amount of gold. After all, going off of the rats justification, he didn't need them anymore. This next item makes it into the video not only because it's pretty useful, but also because the name and description are just funny. The Stormshore Tabernacle, at the earlier end of the Lower City, is a place we'll eventually come with Gale for more quest-related stuff. Though once again, yes, there is a hidden basement that you'll want to check out, carefully disabling the holy fire traps below to find the chamber where all of the offerings are placed. Stealing any of them will inspire a Dark Urge character, and there are three unique things to pick up. Firstly, the Amulet of the Devout, which can increase a character's channel divinity charges by one, useful for Shadow Heart say. Then the Hammer of the Just, which can offer the Detect Thought spell to peer into the minds of others. But the one I really advise you to come down here for is the Shield of Shielding, with a description reading, quotes, named in the style of the extremely unimaginative Jimmy, the geographer and interior decorator who named the Waterfall and the Fireplace, end quotes. And now I'm never going to hear those two words the same way again. Jokes aside though, this shield does also allow us to cast the shield spell, increasing our armor class and nullifying the effects of magic missiles, so the description actually is weirdly accurate. Though fair warning, stealing from these chests will impart the castigated by divinity curse, immediately killing the player when they fall unconscious, and most often spawning divas for the rest of the party then to fight. There is a remove curse scroll down here to do just that, but it still will result in the fight. So technically there is something of a price to pay for stealing these, albeit not in the traditional sense. And coming over to the Baldur's Gate fast travel of the lower city now, and just below it, we can visit Jahira's home. A task best done with Jahira, of course, but regardless, you'll want to find your way into her cellar for not just some cool items in this game, but also callbacks to the initial two titles, Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, which I'll be honest, I'm not old enough to remember. To get inside the cellar then, we'll need to slot a hairpin into Jahira's desk, something we can acquire by speaking to this little kid upstairs called Tate, who claims he was holding holding onto it. Coming down here with Jahira is safe, but otherwise you'll want to overload these defense orbs with their corresponding elemental spells. After which we can speak to a badger and some rats about various goings on in the city, but truly the main prize lies in a hidden chamber behind Jahira's study. She claims there's nothing of value in there, but actually there's some awesome items for her specifically. And first up it's Belm, one of the strongest weapons from Baldur's Gate 2, which here can use the perfectly balanced attack as a bonus action. Then there's the Staff of the Ram, which can knock back and stun foes, and finally, in the display case at the very end, an amulet specifically for Jahira. Khalid's Gift can fully stave off curses, increase Jahira's wisdom score, and has a spell to increase her hit points by 10. Canonically, Khalid was Jahira's husband, but was sadly killed between the events of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, his corpse apparently too badly damaged to even warrant any resurrection. So presumably Jahira stored this down here, as it's too sentimental to risk losing, but given what's at stake and the power it gives her specifically, I think we can justify using it now. For our penultimate entry, here's a 6 in 1 for you. Coming to Sorcerer's Sundries, we'll need to gain access to the lower vaults. Now, this can be done after gaining full access to the tower, where Laroican is, by jumping down and hitting the vaults button. But we can just as easily access it beforehand with a little stealth by lockpicking our way through this door by the portals and interacting with the clasped book to open another portal. First thing you want to do when getting in here is go north, hopefully perceiving this button, to enter a hidden room containing the book on the red 
Knight's final stratagem. This will impart a scroll called Artistry of War, which could be highly effective against a group of six enemies as a blanket attack. Then coming out of that room to this little corridor here, and the wall to the east is actually just an illusion, revealing a room with a magical lamp. Now be careful with who touches this as they'll remain trapped inside in place of a genie, though there is a lot of loot to pick up in there, so worth somebody going inside. To get your companion out of the lamp though, without trapping anyone else, simply move it with a mage hand summon to trap the mage hand instead, which can then obviously be dismissed. Next in the opposite corridor, towards the main door area, is a similar hidden chamber containing some notes on Leroican and nice other loots as well. After that you will want to come into this chamber with three doors, and firstly head through the silver hand door, which will lead to an identical chamber, with an illusion door now at the front, which we want to not go through but rather destroy, as that will reveal a chest with the very rare Hellfire Great Axe, which is good to give to Karlak. After this, the main two rooms we want to access are the Elminster and Cassa's Vaults, both of which can be unlocked by levers after successfully traversing the door maze, or much more simply, just using knock spells. Before going inside though, you'll want to make sure you have the C Invisibility enchantment active on a character, which if you don't have as a passive effect, is pretty simple to get with a potion or a scroll. Now in the Cassa's Vault, that will reveal this chest containing the Faux Breaker Maul, which deals bludgeoning damage even after missing, and in the Elminster Vault similarly reveals the Pyra Quickness Hat, which grants a bonus action if your character deals fire damage by also burning you. Final thing in the Elminster Vault though is the Thartiite Codex, a book that initially curses you, but removing that will instead bless you. Most importantly though, reading this book allows whichever of your characters read the Necromancy of Fae to go back and finish the final part of that book, which you hopefully still have lying around, and doing so will impart the Dance Macabre spell, which once per long rest summons four ghouls to permanently fight alongside us, and basically serve as an entire additional party of cannon fodder. One of the most powerful spells in the game in my opinion, especially given its reusability. And of all the insanely cool stuff down here, I'd overall say that is the best. If you don't know how to find the Necromancy of Thay though, then that's timestamped as a short chapter, number 9 I think, in this video. Final hidden treasure then is a really simple one and can be found by coming down to the docks fast travel points and heading to this ship here. The thing will be guarded by steel watchers, though they're very easy to slip past with an invisibility spell. Investigate these crates at the back and then they'll transform into a pod of six mind flare specimens that were delivered direct from Ketherick Thorm. Opening this up though did seem to cancel the invisibility for me, so you'll then want to quickly jump off the ship before getting detected. Then I guess enjoy six new mind flare abilities, which at a point in the game where you may have unlocked a bunch of new ones is pretty cool indeed. But there's so much more hidden stuff in Baldur's Gate 3, whether that's encounters, hidden treasures, or both, and going forward I do mean to cover plenty more of those now. So comment below any other cool stuff or tips you found, and I might bring them up in other videos. If you do want to chat more directly though, then head over to the Discord server found in the description. And as always, a huge thank you to the patrons for keeping this channel alive. I'm Sam Bram, thank you for watching and have a great day.